Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn webinar. <clears throat> These webinars are provided by the Florida Green Building Coalition and specifically the Realty Appraiser Builder Outreach, Outreach Committee. Uh, my name is CJ Davila and I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Green Building Coalition. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, Peggy Christ, who's our co-chair, um, is going to be able to make it today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move forward here. Um, the Realty Appraiser Builder Outreach Group <clears throat> uh, is a committee uh, that works within uh, the Florida Green Building Coalition's overall structure. Their goal is to provide pre free re webinars um, <clears throat> as a way to help grow FGBC uh, membership and outreach. A few things I'd like to mention before we begin, the recording of this webinar will be available on the FGBC website, as well as our uh, the Florida Green Building Coalition's YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel if you have not yet, as it is a way to uh, keep up to date on some of the um, topics and features uh, associated with the Florida Green Building Coalition. Uh, you're all muted, so please ask questions in the either the Q&A or the chat, and um, we'll get them answered um, as soon as we can. Uh, please, And also, please complete the survey at the end of the webinar as we use these re uh, the results to plan future webinars. Uh, the Florida Green Building Coalition is a nonprofit dedicated to improving the built environment. Our mission is to lead and promote sustainable sustainability with environmental, economic, and social benefits. We do this through regional education and certification programs. Please consider becoming a member today. And some of the benefits include uh, listing on the FGBC website, online database, networking with like-minded professionals, as well as volunteer opportunities. And we just wanted to launch a quick little poll here to see how you heard about us today. Uh, so if you take a, a real quick minute and just let us know how you've how you uh, heard about today's webinar. And thank you for that. And um, looks like the majority of you through email. Um, okay, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Um, FGBC member, Dr. Jennifer Langwell. She's the founder and president of Trifecta Construction Solutions. And today she will outline how Bob Babcock Branch was designed and built to FGBC land development standards, including withstanding devastating natural disasters. She has become a trusted consultant to developers, governments, and municipalities that are rapidly moving towards more sustainable and physically prudent operating and management practices. Babcock Branch developer Sid Kitson and his partners built an environmentally friendly, fully sustainable town that hope, they hoped would be hurricane proof. Residents of Babcock feel their community serves as a blueprint for urban growth in a world devastated by climate change. All homes and commercial buildings uh, within the uh, Babcock Branch development must meet FGBC land development standards. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Lang. Jennifer, you're muted. Can you guys hear me now? There you go. Okay. All right. So I did put a presentation together that really looks at the things that worked well for us at Babcock Ranch during the storm. Um, I do have a separate presentation which goes through each individual credit that we accumulated through the land development certification program but I thought you probably wanted big picture stuff. So with that, I'm going to pull this presentation up, Let's see if we can start it. Do you guys see the full screen or the? It, it's a full screen, yeah. Okay, all right, perfect. So as was mentioned, Babcock Ranch, it's a certified development certified to the platinum level. Um, I think we're one or two points in platinum. It was not an easy task to try and um, get to platinum, so to speak. Not knowing how much you may know about the background of this, um, this was the largest land purchase in the history of Florida. It was ultimately 92,000 acres, roughly. 
and uh, 74,000 was sold back to the state and put into permanent conservation. So what you see um, here is area six, which is what has now become Babcock Ranch. It was the most impacted or disturbed area within the ranch, which is why it was flagged for development. So um, we're located in Charlotte County, but we are we also have land in Lee County. So the land development does span two counties. Um, we have about 5,000 acres of the 18 in Lee County. The um, Basically, we're about five miles north of the Caloosahatchee River. So if you go Fort Myers to us as a crow flies, we're about 12 mi miles from downtown Fort Myers. Uh, and then if you go in on State Road 80 and north on 31, we're again about five, six miles north of the river. And so you can see that in this graphic, this is the Caloosahatchee River, Babcock Ranch. And so this also enabled um, the connection of a couple of different wildlife areas. So we do have a good chunk of preserved land uh, in this area of the state. And so just kind of the, the bullet points that kind of give you the big picture overview of, of the new town because basically there was nothing here and the intent was never to build a master plan community it was to build a multi-generational town so down in southwest florida we tend to have a lot of uh, retirees and so i can tell you the demographic that we're getting at babcock ranch um, is very different than what the developer expected because they were used to the traditional 80% retiree, 20% family, but we're more a 50-50 split. Um, that being said, he did want the school open day one, um, which did also attract families, and the school does continue to attract families here. So it was a greenfield site, and so of course that was a little bit controversial. Um, the land had been impacted with rock mining, with agriculture, and with ranching operations, so it wasn't a pristine preserve, so to speak. It was a, a working ranch. Ultimately, at build out, we'll have about 50,000 people. We will have 19,500 residential units, about 6 million square feet of commercial. And when you look at this area that we are actually developing, so inside of this roughly 18,000 acres, we are setting aside uh, almost 61% of that into conservation areas. So between open space, greenland, green spaces, upland, wetlands, we have about 61% of that land um, also set aside in preservation. 50 miles of trails, we have 150 megawatt photo photovoltaic array, which is you can see up here to the north of us. Um, and we do like to say we're a living laboratory. Sid Kitson and the team here, we're willing to try things. And if they don't work, then we have lessons learned. And if they do work, we figure out how to maybe take the next step. So with respect to the Florida Green Building Coalition certification, um, Obviously, we had the ability to preserve, conserve, and, and restore, so to speak, because we have so much green space, we were able to push conservation to the max. Um, on residential spaces, we have 75% native requirement, 100% drought tolerant on all of the amenity and commercial. It's a 90% native requirement. We have lots of paths and trails and sidewalks, so that does help minimize or limit um, car travel. We do see quite a few golf carts. We're, we're definitely not the villages with respect to golf carts because they've taken it to an entirely different level. Um, but you do see people biking, using skateboards, scooters, golf carts, so definitely uh, multimodal. Uh, looking at utilities, so green power we do have. We have non-potable reclaimed water for irrigation, amenities, parks and trails. And then all of the buildings, as CJ mentioned, are required to be certified. So all of the homes are required to achieve FGBC certification, and all of the commercial buildings are required to, to receive FGBC certification. 
And so really how this process began was extensive site studies. And so these are studies of trails that existed, of timber, of soil, of vegetation, of wildlife, of trees, um, of hydrology. And so we really dug into the land as it was and looked at what a lot of the natural flowways were and looked how we could restore some of these natural flowways. So one example of that is a weir, um, which was put in, again, this was agricultural area, farming area, they needed to, to dry the land, so to speak. Um, and then this was the restoration project that we did to the weir. So again, getting that water back to where mother nature wants it to be inherently. Um, I think one of the good lessons learned here was that fighting mother nature doesn't work. So, um, or at least with Hurricane Ian, I'll say that was a lesson learned. So us restoring these flowways actually was part of what helped us with respect to the storm. And so the things that I'm going to hit on very specific to Ian are going to be power, water, communication, stormwater, native vegetation, and structures. And so initially, because we're at 30 feet elevation and because we are not coastal, um, the vision really of Babcock Ranch was to be a community that restored the natural environment, so a development that did the opposite of what most people think. And most people think that the developers destroy the environment. So the goal was preservation, restoration, and also durability because we were above what we consider any kind of storm surge. And we were inland about, like I said, 12 miles as a crow flies. And so the original pillars, and these are still the pillars today, our core initiatives are the environment, health, education, energy, technology, transportation, and storm safe. So, and fun is the last one, which is kind of cut off because um, that's not my department. So all of those things really are our core values, so to speak, at Babcock Ranch. And so with respect to power, um, Florida Power and Light is, is who provides our services here, and they are working statewide on hardening their infrastructure. So we happen to be in a location where they have already gone through the hardening of that infrastructure. So the typical poles you may see would be these wooden poles. Our poles are these concrete, um, very large, very heavy poles. And so having the hardened infrastructure um, made sure that from the PV array to us at Babcock Ranch and also from the, the natural gas plant to us at Babcock Ranch uh, stayed intact during the storm. And so this is what our PV array looks like. Um, so again, it is shaped like you saw on the, the graphic earlier. It's 150 megawatts, about 880 acres of solar panels. Um, we also do have solar panels on uh, all the Founder Square buildings. So again, this is just supplemental power. You know, we have realized that even if we maximize the roof structures like you can see here, it still isn't necessarily enough power on the building to support the building itself. But again, anything uh, additional solar is good from our perspective. And so how our power works is that um, the Power generated by the solar array is fed into the grid and it comes directly into a substation on our property. Um, then the power is distributed underground to all of the buildings, houses, commercial areas. So everything goes underground from that substation on. If we are not generating enough solar energy, we our backup is the natural gas plant, which again is has hardened infrastructure to us and that also services us at night. So we use two different types of power. And if you think about resiliency, resiliency is really about not putting all your eggs in one basket, having redundancy, having backup. And so that's what this allowed us to do was, was have that redundancy and backup. We also do have batteries at the um, photovoltaic array. And I can tell you that the batteries were not discharged 
during the storm. So normally the sun goes down, our PV array stops generating. We discharge the batteries and use that energy before we switch over to the natural gas plant. So intentionally, FPL held the charge in the batteries because their thought was if the main grid goes down, they then have that backup power. Um, so they never ended up discharging them during the storm because we didn't need to because our um, grid system stayed intact as well as our on-site underground utilities. Real, real quick, Jennifer, um, I've got a question. Why was underground power supply not chosen? We from where the the PV array to uh, the substation? That's an FPL decision. Once it hits our site, it goes underground. Everything at Babcock Ranch is underground, but the transmission lines that FPL has from the PV array to us are above ground, and that's their choice. All right, so just a quick look at what the batteries look like. So a couple different or several banks of batteries and storage. Um, here's our FPL substation. So you can see in this picture these large um, power poles. Again, that's an FPL decision, but as soon as it hits the substation, everything's underground for us. Um, one of the other things that kept us going was we have our own water utility. And so uh, this is our water utility. We have it elevated high enough that, that flood would not be an issue, which is what caused all of the um, boil water notices and lift stations to go down. So not losing power, you lost lift stations. Flooding meant you had sewage now going into your potable supply. So all that water had to be cut off or put into a boil water notice, which we did not have to deal with because we never had an issue of flooding um, and we never lost power. So um, from a water standpoint, fresh water, potable water standpoint, we had no issue. Um, communication. So communication is absolutely critical. Um, we have fiber underground. So that is one thing we do have. Um, we were able to monitor the lake level. So the civil engineer of record who also lives on site was able to monitor the lake levels through the entire storm because we didn't lose power and we didn't lose internet. And so, you know, we have systems set up where we can see the height of the different lakes. Um, and so that having that communication also gave us a certain level of comfort because we were all communicating back and forth um, as to what we were seeing or if we saw issues happening during the storm. And so a part of our stormwater management system are the wetlands. And so you can see in several different locations, there are existing wetlands. Um, in addition to the existing wetlands, we have man-made or restored or created wetlands. So this is an example here of a restored wetland which is adjacent to uh, naturally occurring wetlands, but this was a, a study of all the birds that have come back basically to the area in this wetland. In addition to the created wetlands, um, we have our traditional man-made um, connected lake system, which is our typical stormwater retention that you see usually in the state. Now, these larger lakes were from rock mining operations. The smaller lakes here were dug by the individual builders, in this case, Lennar, in this case, Pulte, um, to again, provide fill dirt for the house pads, um, but also stormwater retention. But all of these lakes are interconnected. So everything is going to go to those lakes first. Uh, if it overflows the lakes, um, were actually designed that in between the water would flow in between the houses and flood the roads. So the roads are intentionally two feet lower than the finished floor elevation of the houses. So we have an additional two feet of capacity in all of the roads. We also have the uh, created wetlands, which are lower. So we would then flow into created and natural wetlands if we needed to. We do have rain gardens. Um, they don't have, I don't wanna say a huge quantity of capacity. We're, they do help, but the volume of water that, that we receive is massive, especially if you looked 
at that preserve area, all of that sheet flow from that preserve area ultimately comes down to us. Also, our um, parks. So, for example, this is Jack People's Park. This is actually a dual use, so it's slightly lower than the rest of the surrounding area. So you can almost see here how it's a little bit lower. So those are also designed to flood in extreme rain events. This is an area adjacent to Founder Square, and you can actually see um, the height difference here. This is the parking lot, and then this is the, the base of the retention area. So we have designed in specifically natural areas that are lower. Um, also, the stormwater management system with the roads being lower um, backed us up. Now, I can tell you that um, it was not I would say a major storm event. So all of these grassy areas also are lower. Um, we had about six and a half inches of rain and we could have handled 14 more inches in capacity. Now that didn't stop us in our debriefing after Ian saying, well, what if? What if this was a more significant rain event than wind event? Do we have the capacity? What should we be thinking about next in this design of the system? And we're already thinking about what we're doing um, next from a standpoint of building an additional redundancy. Also, our verges here, and the verges are the space between the sidewalks and the streets. We do not allow turf or sod. So we require native vegetation because we want water coming off of these sidewalks to be slightly filtered or at least have that initial flush of filtration before it goes into our stormwater system. So that is also part of the comprehensive system for stormwater. So five different things come into play when, it, when we talk about stormwater and mitigating any kind of flooding. We also um, are strong on native vegetation. So as I mentioned, this is, you know, folks replanting pines. You can see the pine forest behind them. Um, we use muley grass. We use all sorts of native stuff. But I, I did want to show you, we had trees down, absolutely had trees down post Ian. Um, this tree probably had been planted three years ago at most. So what we found was, again, a lot of the root structures had not established so um, we had plants that literally had been planted the day before Ian, um, or trees planted the day before Ian. So um, we did have trees down. The storm was Wednesday. We assessed damage Thursday. By Saturday, I'd say about 99% of the trees had been stood back up and secured. So it was a pretty fast um, recovery from a tree standpoint. We did see, or I did see some pictures um, of a YouTube video of people showing these houses crumbled down. Um, I can tell you point blank that those houses had not been poured with concrete or had any rebar in them. So I literally could walk over to one of those walls and with a little effort push one over. Um, so although I was seeing different things, I was like, well, that's not accurate with respect to um, storm and structures. So we do have um, a hurricane shelter here on site. So this is our hurricane shelter. We refer to it as the field house. It can take about 1,380 plus or minus um, individuals. We had two to 300 in there during the storm or after the storm. It's built to ICC 500, which is 200 mile per hour wind load. Um, so you can also see the metal over top. So this is again to protect equipment um, so it is a, definitely a different building standard for this structure itself. The exterior walls are 12 inch thick solid concrete tilt up panels. Um, the interior partitions are either eight inch concrete partitions, uh, tilt up panels, or um, we do have some CMU inside, but basically the entire building is hose downable as I would call it. So we intentionally put hose bibs inside of the building so that after an event like this, it would be easy to clean. Um, these are the two schools right now, high school and um, K through eight school. Those were built as designed for this area by the code. So they're built to 160 as are all of the houses and other commercial structures. So everything here is, again, Florida Building Code 160. 
um, which is, you know, what made me a little bit nervous when I saw the winds go up to 155 on the storm. Um, but again, building code. Now, what we did do um, with respect to the builders is we focused a lot on education and training. And so when we were training them on the Florida Green Building Coalition certification standard, we emphasized disaster mitigation and durability. And we said, you know, part of the vision here was being able to shelter in place. And so although we, Babcock Ranch, didn't dictate to the builders anything specific they needed to do from the disaster mitigation category, um, we emphasized that this was really the vision of the community. This is what the ambassadors know to talk about. So the more durability features they put in their homes, the better. Um, I would have to pull up checklists to go back and see exactly what each builder was doing specifically from a durability standpoint. But because FGBC is the only certification standard that really has that, um, we really wanted to differentiate these homes using that. And with that, I can end. And I'm guessing questions are probably the easiest um, way to go about getting you guys the information you need or giving you additional information specifically about certification if that's something you're looking for. Yeah, Jennifer, can you can you just talk a little bit about the uh, FGPC land development and kind of the, 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 the framework provided that you guys worked within uh, the FGPC certification program? A little bit of the so as I'm trying to, you know, explain to a lot of the reporters and everything, um, the conversation that we're having is it's not that what FGBC is asking us to do is 180 from a typical development. Uh, in some instances, if you don't have a lot of land to preserve, you know, it might be 180 from your additional plan, um, original plan. But for example, if you're a land development or a community and you're going to put in sidewalks and those sidewalks happen to be four foot wide, what FGBC does is FGBC says, you know what, there's additional benefit from going five foot or wider than that because two people can walk back and forth, people can walk shoulder to shoulder with a baby stroller. So there's an advantage to kind of code plus um, within your community. And so when you start looking at the, the land development standard, that's really what you find. You find the best management practice that you likely were doing or considering already, plus a little benefit. So even if it's street lighting, it's street lighting, and then we look at, well, let's get more efficient street lighting or solar street lighting. So throughout the entire standard, that's really what you find. Um, I mean, I would be happy to run through um, all of the things Babcock did, but again, it's a platinum <laughs> certification, so it's, it's quite extensive. A lot of the preserves contributed significantly. Um, I can actually. And, and I, think, I think that's good. I think I, what I would mention is that if anybody's interested in learning more about the land development program, just visit our website, floridagreenbuilding.org. Um, and you'll see uh, our certification programs. And if you drop down the land development um, certification program, there will be a checklist which will go through all of the options that are available for certification. So, um, Jennifer, there are some um, chats and questions if you want to uh, go, go ahead and take those. All right. So let me move this so I can actually read it. So um, I do not believe we have any. So the question is, what's the current more or less inventory of houses for sale at Babcock Ranch? Um, what is currently probably listed for sale, I'd say would be less than 20 houses that are available for purchase right now. Um, the builders have continued to, to build and our sales did not actually drop at all during COVID. So we've maintained a, a good sales record throughout. What you see are some resales, you know, different people being transferred for jobs. Um, and then you do see a couple of houses come online that I would consider inventory, but it's not a huge quantity at any given time. 
Right now we have 2,000 houses that are closed and occupied, um, which is about 5,000 people. So we have 2,000 of the 19,500 that we'll ultimately have and about 5,000 of the 50,000 people we'll ultimately have. So we're in its infancy, I would say, um, but things move very quickly. We, you know, the builders are taking down additional parcels. We're adding additional criteria to those builders that are consistent with the original vision of having pocket parks and having front porches and all of those things. So we're starting now to push on the builders more. Um, Initially, we had a lot of builders that, you know, they just didn't believe that there was no proof of concept from a sustainability standpoint or a durability standpoint. So a lot of the builders were kind of, you guys go out there to the wild, wild west of the frontier and, and you be the frontiers. And then when it works, we'll, we'll join you. So we're at that, well, it worked and they're joining us um, kind of area in the, the process. Um, one question is, do houses have solar panels? So you absolutely can have solar panels if you want. That is a owner choice. Um, the builders are supposed to be informing the potential buyers or buyers about um, solar panels. We have found that that's not always the case. So we have started working on some additional training because the salespeople turn over um, regularly and they're the ones that have that initial contact with the potential customer, I would say. And so they're the ones that we have to get comfortable with sustainability. So we went through and did a series of eight different um, videos that really talked through her scores, energy efficiency, water efficiency, durability, and all of those items. And um, those are available online so that the builders can train without having to get a meeting together. Um, so yes, we do have solar. I'd say maybe 10% of the houses that I see have solar. We're starting to see more and we're starting to see some battery backups inside the houses. Um, but for the most part, I would say it's again an owner choice. All right, do we have requirements for residential landscaping? So yes, we do. Again, natives are a big chunk of it. All drought tolerant is a big chunk of it. And we also limit the quantity of, of turf grass they can have. So one of our big pushes is towards water efficiency. And we know that turf uses more water than drought tolerant vegetation. So um, it's a maximum of 50% total turf that you're allowed to have on your lawns. We also have regulations regarding fertilizers and pesticides. Um, in a lot of the communities, the uh, landscape is taken care for you. So for example, where I am, I don't cut my grass. I don't do anything. It's done for me. So the good news is that we've trained all of those subcontractors in what's required versus a, a subcontractor or even a homeowner that doesn't know better than applying certain types of pesticides or fertilizers. And then you don't actually end up complying with your regulations because you have too many people, too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. Um, homes here are all concrete block, and I can't say all, but the majority of them are, are concrete block. We do have four that are SIPs, um, structurally insulated panels. What we had in the very beginning were five different builders. One of the five builders chose to build out of SIPs because, you know, he was told how much more efficient and tight of a building envelope that he would get with them, and he wanted to differentiate once we started collecting data, we actually found that there was no statistical difference between the efficiency of the block houses and the SIPs. So the SIPs were a $40,000 ad at that time. So that time would have been five years ago. And because we were able to collect the data and compare, we were able to give the builders feedback to say, look, you know, if you want to do it, that's fine, but we're not seeing the energy benefit expected or promised by um, the sales folks. Let's see. All right, the rate for electricity, it's the same as the market rate for electricity. And I honestly don't know off the top of my head if it's 11 cents or 13 cents a kilowatt hour, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. So we don't have reduced rates. Um, we pay for our power just like we pay for our power. It's not 
Um, everyone sometimes comes here thinking that they're going to have free power, uh, but someone has to pay for all those panels. <laughs> so the 880 acres of panels out there, um, if FPL wasn't in the mood to give away free power, I guess. They're in the business of selling power. Um, I did mention already that we have some with battery backup. There was another question about battery backup. Um, do I have plans to build any other communities like Babcock? So Sid Kitson has always said he wants people to copy him. Um, there's nothing here that's really proprietary. You know, it's a combination of things. It's redundancy, it's resilience, it's sustainability that, that put us where we are. What I found with other developers prior to this was that you would present them a, a buffet of items and they would um, be my kid who only ate the mac and cheese. They would pick one thing on that buffet and do it. And it's not one thing that gives you what we have here. It's a combination of all of those. Does resiliency plan include uh, potable water, water infrastructure? So we have, again, potable water coming from TCU. Um, we do on the shelter have backup wells because that is required for shelters that you have um, multiple backup systems to your water supply. So in that instance, we have backup. Um, what we did also learn here is that we're adding an additional substation uh, because if our substation had been hit by lightning and went down, then we would have lost power. So that is a vulnerability for us right now, um, is that we don't necessarily have uh, the backup substation. Um, we're not really using any kind of program. I mean, we're active. All of us are active in ULI, USGBC, FGBC, NGBS, all of the, the initial soup or alphabet soup you have out there. So it, we're looking at what the best management practices are. I'm regularly in contact with um, Deirdre Irwin, who's with the Water Management District, talking about better ways we can save water or treat water or do different things. So even though we feel lucky or grateful that what we have here worked, like I said, we immediately had a debriefing. We immediately were talking about what if, what if the winds were stronger? What if um, the there was more rain? What if our substation had been hit? Um, and I've already engaged or Fortified has already engaged me in um, having conversations about moving to the Fortified uh, building standard as another baseline performance for us. Uh, I know insurance is going to be an issue uh, coming up, and because the Fortified standard is supported by the insurance companies, um, they will insure you and they you will get reduced rates if you build to Fortified. So I have them reviewing plans right now to give me feedback as far as what's the delta that it would take to get the homes at Babcock Ranch up to the fortified standards so that, again, we can offer that as a benefit to the community. How much more expensive would I say the community is because we've taken the, the measures that we've taken? Um, we did not have any state or federal funding. Now, what? so yes, it did cost more. Was it significantly more? No, it was an incremental step. As I said, you know, instead of the four foot sidewalk, we went to a five. I mean, in some areas we have eight feet, 10 feet sidewalks. Um, tying all of the systems in from a stormwater standpoint, standpoint and planning to have all of the additional backups that we have. Yes, you know, it, it takes a bit more to do that than it does just to dig a single lake. But a lot of it has to do with our scale. Um, we see a lot of sustainable communities, but they're 200 houses. We don't see a sustainable town. So uh, as far as expense is concerned, we do see return on investment pretty quickly with all of the choices that we're making. Um, so pushing us down that road, to me, it wasn't an issue. Um, this is really the first developer I worked with that actually did all the things they said they were going to do. So that was a pleasant surprise. Um, and also made it very clear in our debriefing that we're not going to sacrifice durability, resilience, or sustainability. Um, if it's a cost 
increase, we're, we're going to spend it. So that was made very clear to the entire team um, in our debriefing that, that there is clearly a value to this and that value outweighs saving a couple dollars here and there. Um, I know there is currently federal funding out there for resiliency. Um, the civil engineer record, like I said, she mentioned things like when you are um, expanding a road and if you do rain gardens all along the side of the road in lieu of a traditional um, water system or, or do a system with additional capacity, that that type of thing could be funded through this federal resiliency money. Um, because it is building in redundancy and the federal resiliency money could actually be more than the cost of just a traditional uh, water retention type system. So you have to do digging and, and research um, for municipalities. I know it's available. I'm not sure if it's available for the private sector yet. Um, garbage collection and recycling. So we have our own guy, Tony. Um, and he has his own facility here. Um, we actually could not initially get anyone to take recycling from us. So we built basically a warehouse and housed all of the stuff to be recycled for almost a year and a half before we were able to get a contract um, with Lee County to take the recycling. So um, we're very committed to it, committed enough to stockpile it from a recycling standpoint for a while. So, um, you know, Ecologic is the name of the company. Uh, Tony is the, the guy. And so he does trash and recycling on different days. Let's see, studied the use of cold form steel panelized construction for, okay, so we do have some steel structures. Um, the Discovery Center downtown is steel. Um, and Sid's house is, is also steel. So from a, a cost standpoint, those buildings downtown originally were in Founder Square. There are five buildings. I want to say all of them were uh, steel design. And at the time of construction, it, it just cost less to do concrete. Um, we have also run into issues with all of the Amazon warehouses taking up a lot of the steel. So from a supply chain standpoint, um, would probably be why you don't see more steel. We have had to modify multiple plans of buildings because of supply chain issues. Um, net metering, I, I believe it's available. Honestly, I don't know off the top of my head. I thought it was a requirement by law, but it, that may have changed. So I would have to look up whether or not FPL offers net metering. Um, dark sky, so we do have dark sky requirements because we are in a green area. We have um, lots of wildlife. And so we do require uh, dark sky compliance. Um, we have had to go after a couple of, of homeowners who wanted to use super bright floodlights and it looked like you were trying to land a plane um, and just say, you know, this is not, not acceptable here and this is why, right? We want to be conscious of all of the different um, wildlife that's out there and not really disturb them. Uh, let's see. So sheltering in place is, is one question. Um, so I can tell you, Monday, we were not in the cone. Um, so it says net metering. Someone just popped net metering is still on Florida. So that would be, yes, FPNL uh, allows net metering. So Monday, we were not in the cone. Tuesday morning, we were in the cone. So uh, Tuesday morning is when I put up shutters. So in, in lieu of working, um, I opted to start putting up my shutters. Um, and I called my husband and told him he needed to come down and get the second floor because I wasn't going to get up on the roof um, and do the second floor. So by the time he made it down, it, which was uh, Tuesday evening, we had tropical storm force winds. So it was already getting pretty windy out here. Um, I can tell you I had multiple families evacuate to my house. So I had a house full of people. I think I had nine adults, five kids four dogs, um, and we were all come Wednesday basically watching the storm live on TV because we had the ability to watch TV. And I can tell you my my sliding glass doors were 
um, bowing in and out and they were tapping my chair. So I had to continually move my chair further away from um, the glass. So I had pulled up my construction drawings to know that the house was designed to 160. I had looked at the elevations to know my finished floor elevation is 30. The road finished um, elevation is 28 at Crest of Road. You know, so there are a couple of things I did go back and look and check. Um, now, where would we have gone if we didn't stay here? I would have gone um, a 10 minute or five minute walk from here to the shelter, which I know could withstand 200 mile per hour. So most people um, that sheltered in place, I, I'm not hearing about people who evacuated from Babcock. So most people here did shelter in place and you can find videos and stories of them, you know, again, saying we didn't lose power. So that was great. Um, ICF construction, so insulated concrete forms. We have not had any builders do ICF yet. I personally love them. Um, they are 200 mile per hour wind load resistant inherently because of the poured solid concrete. So um, it just, one is not necessarily, there is a cost premium to it. So the builders would have to choose that. And two, you really need a good sub, a good um, crew, because if they don't brace the ICF correctly, you'll get some bow in the walls. And then you end up having to butter up uh, stucco to plumb the walls. And that's not ideal. So it definitely is a, you need a good crew for ICF construction. Uh, community composting. So we do have a community garden. There is composting available there. Um, we also have found that you need someone to manage that process that, that left up to the homeowners, despite the fact that they all say they want it. Um, they don't necessarily take care of it as it should be taken care of. So we do have a dedicated person um, who takes care of, of composting and the community garden. Um, advice for developers who shy away from sustainable solutions because of the expense. Well, I, I would just say, look at the billions of dollars of damage and we're not any part of it. So, you know, yes, does it cost more? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's just doing the right thing in the right way and not necessarily costing more. So not everything costs more, um, but indeed there's a value to it. And Although we didn't want this rigorous of a test for our first test, um, we survived the test. And so we're happy with the results that we're seeing. We're happy with the fact that we weren't and are not contributing to, um, you know, what first responders had to deal with. Uh, impact glazing on windows. So some homes have impact glazing, some homes have shelters. So again, that's a home builder um, choice. So as the land developer, again, our focus is horizontal. We do training, obviously, for vertical, um, but those builders are, you know, independent guys and they can choose how they want to differentiate themselves. Is the shelter a dual purpose building? Yes, the shelter is also the gym and cafeteria and kitchen for the high school. So um, during the time we had individuals in the shelter. We have a full service kitchen and cafeteria at the K-8. So we were feeding um, both schools out of that one kitchen while that building was being used as a shelter. But when it's not being used as a shelter, it is used for the school. K through 12 use it. Um, average purchase price, purchase price cost per square foot. So I'd have to actually pull numbers. I can tell you the um, least expensive whether it's a condo, townhome, villa type thing, or, or I'd say in the low twos, um, right around 200,000. And there are houses in here that go up to, to one and a half million. So it just depends on what price point you're at. There's also uh, villas. We have apartments coming online. We have townhomes coming online. So um, there are a lot of opportunities and options here. Um, I am engaged with with Sid and having conversations about affordable housing, um, as I'm also chair of the school board. And so I know the challenge of getting teachers and teachers being able to pay um, realistic rents or mortgages is tough. So we're 
currently that's on the top of our list and we're brainstorming through that because we feel that it's in a town everyone can't afford a 200,000 or 300,000 dollar house so how can we make it where our servers and our salespeople and our teachers um, can all be in this town because we think there's also a community social value to having that kind of network of people you know i know these kids the principal lives here she knows these kids so guess what these kids don't act out because they know that i can walk over to their parents house um, and get them in trouble so there's a, a value associated with community and we do have you know from newborn babies to um, retirees uh, we do veterans parades, we engage all ages. So I really do appreciate that from a standpoint of the community working on that as part of this piece of sustainability. So I think I hit most of them. I think we're good with questions. So um, I, I wanted, uh, on behalf of FGBC, I wanted to thank Dr. Langwell for a great presentation today. Uh, and we are very uh, excited and happy to be a partner with uh, Babcock Ranch on their endeavors. So um, I will be forwarding out uh, Dr. Langwell's contact information along with a notice when the video is uploaded to YouTube to everybody who registered. So with that, um, we'll say uh, goodbye. So thank you. Bye-bye.